Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's found in the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll skip to 11b through 32. And I invite you to follow along. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and fused, refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This parable needs no explanation. We know it as the prodigal son. We've heard it so many times within the church. This parable needs no explanation. Yet every time we hear it and every time we share it, we do exactly that. We try to explain away our discomfort with it. We try to reason its peculiarities away. And we say, this is a really good teaching for us to know because that younger son repented. He decided to go home. He was ashamed of his behavior. He repented and went back. So as people of faith, this is a lesson that we need to follow. Yet when we look at the text, did the younger son really change his behavior? We don't know that. All we are told is that he came to his senses. We don't know if he truly reconciled with his father. Or what about that older brother? As people of faith, we don't like that ending. It's too wide open. So we try to fill in the gaps and we say, well, of course he finally went in. He, of course, went in to join in that celebration. He also came to his senses and went back into the party and joined in because you had to rejoice. The one who was lost is now home. As people of faith, we like to pretty up 
that ending and fill in the gaps, but we honestly have no idea if that older son ever went into that celebration. All we know is that the, extend, the invitation was extended. It was there waiting, waiting for the other brother. But we have no idea if he ever accepted the invitation to go in and celebrate. Every time we hear this parable, every time we share it, every time we engage this parable we know as the prodigal son, we try to make it into something it is not. We try to make it fit into something we understand. We try to make it fit into our rules and regulations. We try to make it fit into our very limited understanding of the kingdom of God. When we hear this parable, when we engage this parable, we want, I'm going to say differently, we need this parable to fit into what we understand into what we can control. We need this parable to fit into our very limited understanding of the kingdom of God, because if it doesn't, that means everything, everything we use to keep others out and only invite a select few in, everything we know and use to separate and divide no longer matters. We need to be in, understand this parable by our rules and regulations, because if we don't, that means we're not in control. And we cannot handle that fact. Testify number one right here. We need this parable to fit into our very limited understanding of the kingdom of God. Because if it, it doesn't, if it doesn't, the kicker is we don't get to decide who's in and who's out. That means it's up to God. And when you th leave things up to God, that's when it gets a little interesting and beyond our control. The bottom line is this parable is all about grace. This parable reminds us that the kingdom of God does not ask our permission on who is worthy and who is not. This parable reminds us that the kingdom of God does not need our opinion on who is in and who is out. This parable of the prodigal son reminds us that the kingdom of God does not play by our rules. This parable reminds us that the kingdom of God extends the invitation of welcome, extends the invitation of grace to one and all. And the kingdom of God doesn't care whether we like it or not. Bottom line, this parable is about God's grace. Something which offends us, something which saves us. This parable is about God's grace, something which annoys the fire out of us and something which renews us every single time. I shared earlier this week that I have a love-hate relationship with this parable and I dread when it comes up within our lectionary teachings. I love this parable because this image of this father running down the road, caution to the wind, joyously going to celebrate this younger son's return. I hate this parable because it acts like a mirror to me. It acts like a mirror and it reflects back to me all those times when I have been less than gracious, all those times I have been less than welcoming, all those times when I did not practice my faith as I preach it here in the pulpit. I love this text because I can relate so many times to that younger brother. 
There are all those times where I think, I've got it. I don't need your help. I know what I am doing. Leave me alone. I'm on track. Only to find up, I don't know what I'm doing. I've gotten off track and I need help. I love this parable because it reminds me in all of those moments when I mess up, and I admit they're few and far between, <laughs> all those moments when I mess up, this stands as a reminder that there is always, always, always someone there welcoming home. There is always, always, always there someone joyous about my coming to my senses. There is always, always there someone welcoming me and reminding me who I am and whose I am. I hate this parable because I can also relate to the older brother. That reminds me of the many, many times where I have withheld grace, where I have withheld welcome, where I have passed judgment without knowing all the facts, where I have offered my opinion as it's the only right way and you should be taking it. I hate this parable because it reminds me of all those times I stood outside the party with my arms crossed, grumbling and growling, passing judgment and picking out all the faults in everyone else while ignoring the same faults that I found in myself. I think this love-hate relationship with this parable is the exact same reaction that people had the first time that Jesus shared it. We're told in this text that the religious leaders are there and they're seeing their sinners and tax collectors coming to Jesus and he's eating with him, he's breaking bread. And so he tells them this parable. I almost can imagine that Jesus has just finished this parable and someone goes, yeah, but what about, what about my neighbor who just is doing all these things wrong and won't listen to me because I know the right way? Jesus simply shrugs his shoulders and says, grace. Yeah, but what about, what about that single mother who has children? She decided to have those children, not me. Why in the world am I supposed to be helping that person? I think Jesus says again, grace. Yeah, but what about, what about that illegal immigrant who's coming in, taking my jobs? What about that person who doesn't fit into my rules and to my understanding of what a good citizen should be? Jesus simply says, grace. But what about Jesus? What about this person who is poor? I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Why can't they? I think Jesus simply says again, grace. Jesus, what about those sinners? As they cast that side eye to them in judgment. Jesus responds, grace. What about those tax collectors? You know, like that word, disgust them as it comes out of their mouth. Grace. But Jesus, what about? And this is when I think Jesus throws up his hands and interrupts and goes, I'm going to tell you this right now. We can do this all day, this but what about? The answer is and has always will be forevermore. Grace. Because, as someone who is way smarter than me said, belief in a violent and retributive God who punishes imperfect people is reflected in imperfect people who punishes with violent retribution. But belief in forgiving and a merciful God who loves imperfect people is reflected in imperfect people who love with forgiving mercy. But Jesus, what about? I'm going to tell you again. The answer is always grace upon grace upon grace. May it be so. Amen.